Well, we move on into chapter 10 of OpenStax College Physics, studying rotation, the dynamics, the kinematics, and the dynamics of rotation. This will be uh, familiar ground for you, hopefully. The equations that appear in this chapter have appeared before in linear form. In this chapter, they'll have angular variables, but the techniques of problem solving are very, very similar in this chapter compared to what we have done in previous chapters, you know, starting in, in chapter two. Um, so here we go. Tornadoes, rotation, high wind speed at the uh, funnel. As this funnel narrows down, uh, wind speed picks up. There's a good reason for that. We'll discuss that actually in the next video. It won't appear in this video. Um, ice skater, causing the uh, mass of the body to be closer to the axis of rotation. Ice skater speeds up. Next video. Not won't be discussed in this video. So here we are for this video. We've uh, worked with this before. When we have circular motion, we talked about a so radius r for a circle, a central angle. I'll just use theta instead of delta theta. And then the velocity that's tangent to the circle. And there are some connections here between the linear distance along the arc of the circle and theta. That connection is the factor of r. Now, S equals r times theta. The arc length equals the radius of the circle multiplied by the central angle. You must use radians for the central angle. Then there's a connection between the angular velocity in radians per second and the linear velocity in meters per second, let's say. Um, so we calculate V equals R times omega. Omega must be in radians per second. So be careful if you ever see degrees in these types of problems. One step that you'll have to make will be to convert the degrees into radians using the conversion factor of 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees or pi radians equals 180 degrees. But uh, we've got these basic descriptions of the motion, the arc length traveled, uh, the s equals r theta, and the linear velocity is equal to the radius or distance from the axis of rotation multiplied by the angular velocity. Um, we have the situation that the velocity is uh, tangent to the circle. There's also a tangential acceleration that we are not going to make much use of, but it, uh, it does appear. So let's talk about how we make things rotate. And I should say too, I've, I've not put a slide in here that shows the four kinematic equations. Um, those equations are on the reading guide that I supply to my students. Or if you remember the uh, four linear kinematic equations, the first one was final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. To generate the angular kinematic equations, you simply make substitutions. Every place V appears, you put in omega. Every place A appears, you put in alpha, the angular acceleration. Um, and T remains the same. So that first kinematic equation, V equals V naught plus AT, becomes omega, the final angular velocity, equals omega naught, the starting angular velocity, plus alpha multiplied by time. And similarly, for each of the four equations, if you have x, you put in theta. If you have v, you put in omega. If you see a, you put in alpha. And there are no extra r's. The r's cancel off if you would make a substitution of our uh, linear uh, quantities with, you know, put in v, replace v with r times omega, uh, replace x with r times theta. And you'll find that the R cancels off. So in the kinematic equations for angular motion, there are no factors of R lurking about the equations. So you solve those problems in the same way. You make a sketch. You write down what uh, quantities you know, what you don't know. Um, many times you'll be able to select one of the four kinematic equations where there's only one unknown and go ahead and uh, complete the solution. All right, to the tire now. How do we make things rotate? In the linear uh, case, we asked, why do things accelerate? And we found F equals MA gives us an explanation for the acceleration. Depends on the force, depends on the mass. In a similar way, rotation is caused by torque. T 
torque takes the place of force. Um, if you have more torque, you get more angular acceleration. And there's a relationship, torque equals rotational inertia multiplied by alpha. So this is similar to F equals MA, mass is inertia, but it's a little bit different. So torque, and that's going to be uh, force times lever arm producing a torque. You will need to be careful that the force is perpendicular to the lever arm. That is the case here for this person pulling on the tire. You can imagine the lever arm going back down to the axis of rotation. This force is perpendicular. Though so torque, force times lever arm. Rotational inertia is a little bit different. Um, for inertia, for F equals MA, we just use mass in kilograms. The rotational inertia depends on the mass and also where the mass is located, how far away from the axis of rotation. So we're going to show you how to calculate that, but just uh, keep that in mind. This rotational inertia is mass. If you have more mass, you're going to have more rotational inertia, other things being the same. But it's also possible to create more rotational inertia if the mass is constant, but you move the mass to a, a position further from the rotation axis. So torque equals rotational inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. Torque equals I times alpha. This is equivalent to F equals MA, but now in the, uh, the rotating system. So if we are out here on the wheel and we pull this way, we can generate a significant torque and we get a good alpha value. If we pull on the spokes near the center, the lever arm is small, we won't generate much torque, and the alpha value will be smaller. Uh, so here's the table. You do not have to memorize these for my class, uh, but uh, you need to be familiar with these formulas and how things are calculated. Let's just take a look here at mr squared, i equals mr squared. When all the mass is the same distance away from the axis, the radius r, then the calculation of rotational inertia is simply mr squared. Um, if you take a look at this one, a cylinder, solid cylinder with rotational axis through the long axis, it's one half mr squared. Some of the mass is closer to the axis of rotation and does not resist motion as much, rotation as much. This would be a merry-go-round uh, shape. It's just a short cylinder but if you have mass all the way from the edge into the axis then we have one half mr squared as a calculation. Uh, a sphere, solid sphere, two-fifths mr squared. And if we uh, spin the axis, the rod around the center, you know, one-twelfth mr squared, ml squared, sorry, where l is the length from end to end, and various other shapes. Um, so we'll practice with a little bit with that in my class. How does a uh, person spin up a merry-go-round? Well, you push on the outside. That gives you a big lever arm. And you push perpendicular to the lever arm. That gives you significant torque. And the merry-go-round speeds up. So that's our introduction, the concepts. For rotation motion, we have four kinematic equations that relate theta, sort of the angular distance uh, of rotation, and the angular velocity, and the angular acceleration. And then what causes angular acceleration is torque. Torque equals I times alpha. We'll use that relationship often to uh, find the value of alpha, and then go back to the kinematic equations and calculate the uh, quantity of interest. So keep reading and ask questions.